Hi, this is Nicole Kupchik and welcome to 10 Minute Tidbits. Today, I'm here with Joel Green and we are going to chat about substances. Okay, but before we chat, hit the subscribe button. There's a little bell next to the subscribe button that will notify you when new videos are launched. I didn't know about the little bell know thing. Did you know yeah, about it? No. Oh, crazy, okay? So hit the little bell thing and subscribe. So anyway, we are gonna chat about sepsis. Okay, September yes. is here. It is here. What yes. does September mean to you? Um, I, it's fall, finally. It's fall, not the right? 80s and 90s working night shift trying to sleep. Oh, that's love the worst, it starts right? cooling down. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so it means it's warmer. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, all about pumpkin. So pumpkin everything. All right, what else? Uh, back to school. Uh, yes, yes, back to school. Uh, but it's also a very important awareness month. What month is it? As you mentioned, it is sepsis yeah, awareness. Yeah, it's sepsis awareness yeah. month. And I don't, sepsis is near and dear to my heart for sure. Um, you know, if you had to kind of think of your top 10 patient you enjoy taking care of, who oh, is it? Definitely sepsis ARDS and yeah. the super sick cardiac surgery patient. Those are yeah. the two big ones. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, there's this like mis mystery about sepsis. And so one of the things Joel and I want to talk about, we're going to actually do a couple episodes about sepsis because it's so important. But um, I think recognition is the toughest. Oh, definitely, yeah. It is so challenging to recognize these mm -hmm. patients. So as a clinical nurse specialist, I started and ran a sepsis program for years and um, because I was just sick of seeing patients die. Yeah. And do you ever like have a pa like maybe a few patients you can think of that you wish you could maybe go back and do it over? Yeah, and I mean in hindsight, we always say hindsight yeah. is twenty twenty that always. I would have recognized it sooner. I would have done these things right? differently. But then yeah. again, sometimes that's also how the dice of fate rolled. So yeah, you know, and you just hope it's just not you know right. one of your loved ones. Yeah. But you know, I I, I agree though. But yeah. um. Yeah, and I'll never forget a patient who was really young. He was in his 30s, and um, he died within 24 hours of, of admission because he was under-resuscitated. Mm -hmm. Why was he under-resuscitated? Because he had acute, um, I'm sorry, chronic kidney disease. He had chronic kidney disease because of familial hypertension, and he was waiting for a, a kidney transplant, and so everyone's afraid to give him fluid, but he's septic. Okay, so first of all, I think one of the things we all need to understand is sepsis is a vasodilatory, um, or has a vasodilatory mm -hmm. vascular response. So patients vasodilate and then the other big thing that happens is your capillaries become super duper leaky right. So what happens to your fluid? So everything that was tight and in all those spaces now is open and everything's going out extra so. Yeah, so you're third spacing yeah. a ton of fluid and so fluid is a mainstay But here's one of the things that's super duper important is we can't overdo it with fluids We're gonna talk about fluids later, but yeah. let's talk about recognition because I think recognition is really really challenging It is tough and yeah. I mean in a lot of times for us in the ICU, the recognition is coming from other places. So we may be seeing patients coming in with sepsis from the ER, we may be seeing them coming in from the yeah. telemetry floors, from other acute care floors, yeah. um, whereas we in the ICU, that's where we're getting them from. But we also experience it firsthand too, where we've had a patient for a couple days yeah. with a UTI, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they're in forward sepsis, and we missed a step or we missed a cue that flipped them from yeah. just the acute infection to a systemic infection. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. And um, there's actually this new term called chronic critically ill when patients who have had or experienced an infection in sepsis can are much more prone to developing an, a secondary right. sepsis yeah. and it, it's it's they they don't do well long yeah. term so okay so let's you have to think about sepsis in a couple different ways those who present through the emergency department and um, and actually that is the most common presentation mm -hmm. is through the emergency department but then also there's patients that develop sepsis under our noses right. while they're hospitalized yeah. so all right so through the ED how do we recognize sepsis? And I think for years it's been SIRS criteria, yeah, right? Sure. So, so, so what are the SIRS criteria? So we're looking at rate greater than 90. Yep. Uh, we're looking at WBCs greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000. Perfect. So we'd be looking at respiratory rates greater than 20. Yeah. Uh, in titles less than, I forget. What well, there was a study that was done less yeah. than 25. Less than 25. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we'd be looking at temperatures greater than 38 or less than 36. Yeah. And, and if you think about this, so, okay, so heart rate that's fast, breathing fast, 
white count that's up or down, mm -hmm. in, um, and then a temperature that's up or down. So in the ED, this can be super challenging. So yeah. first of all, you don't have white counts at triage, right? right. So now you're not a three criteria. Mm -hmm. So heart rate, okay, there are a number of reasons you can have a fast heart rate. Yep. Okay, respiratory rate. Let's yeah. just be honest. Right. We're going to be really honest right here. Yeah. Everyone documents what? 16. Or 18. Yes, or, or 14. 18. So, and, and this is a yeah. well-known phenomena. Mm. So, and I, I, what's like your go-to respiratory? Because let's be honest, you're like, oh no, I count it. The BS, type, we don't count it, the right? The type A person me always wants it to be 14. 14? Because okay, I don't want to be like everybody else. You don't want to be like everyone else. Because I'm a 16 Even in PACU, I'm the yeah, same way. It's like, yeah. oh, it's 14, They always bring 14 yeah. or 16, yeah. And so, uh, all right, so what is your go-to respiratory if they're really getting sick? Uh, if they're really getting sick, it's 28. 28? Okay. Yeah. I'm usually like 28 or 32, yeah. yeah. So, but this is a major problem. And we all know we make up the respiratory right. all the time. And again, I'm going to totally yes. call BS on you if you're like, no, I know, I count it. BS. So anyway. And you also can't trust the bedside monitors that say the respiratory oh, rate. No. Because impedance respiratory is not 100% yeah. accurate. No, it's it's very inaccurate, actually. But, you know, where can you count other derived respiratory rates? From a mechanical ventilator, yeah. absolutely. Right. From, or entitled CO2 yeah. monitors with capnography. Absolutely. But, um, and there's this one meme. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but it's like when it's a Simpsons meme yeah. and it says when you write 16 respirations oh. but don't count them. And Homer Christ disappears into the bushes. is watching. You know, so anyway. But it, this is a super well-known phenomenon. Yeah. But you know, um, Donna Edelson and Matt Chirpak, who are out of the University of Chicago, um, they've done some amazing work in early warning systems mm -hmm. and they studied for, I mean, they've studied for decade, uh, over a decade, they've studied patients. And one, or, or I should say, the most predictive vital sign is what? Respiratory. Respiratory rate. Yeah. yeah, so respiratory rate by far is the most predictive vital sign to identify decompensation. And why? Well, if you get acidotic, how do you get rid of acid? You blow it off. Exactly. Yeah. But what are your rights? 16, 16, 16 18, yeah. 18, 16. So a patient with a 16 yeah, so. is not blowing off their yeah. CO2. So yeah. if you didn't get anything out of this, yeah. just count your respirations. Or at least, you know, 10 seconds multiplied by 6. Yeah. It's all good. Or 6 seconds multiplied by 10. So. And for those of you who aren't familiar yeah. with early warning systems out there, um, um, there's a lot of software that works. They can, sometimes yeah. they're through your EHR, uh, sometimes they're, you're through your bedside monitoring equipment. Um, different companies are trying to help us out as yeah. best they can where they're taking these criteria of heart rate, respiratory rate. Um, some incorporate blood pressure, mm -hmm. some incorporate temperature, and then they flag you either on your monitor or through your EHR. Yeah. And I did, um, on my website, NicoleCupchickConsulting.com, I did a free webinar that has, you can get CEs for it, uh, on early warning systems. And the thing is, we don't have, I'll just be honest, like SIRS is kind of mm -hmm. what we've commonly used. Um, you, the predictability of it is maybe... 60-ish, 65%. Mm -hmm. So you're going to kind of cast the net wide. You're going to, everyone's going to have SIRS, but the right. key question I, you have to ask is do you suspect infection? Right. But, you know, um, I, I do really think we need to go to more electronic types yeah. of, of surveillance. Right. And so MUSE is one, so the Modified mm -hmm. Early Warning System. Um, now in uh, uh, the UK, they use something called NEWS, the National right. Early Warning System, and that's actually got a little bit better predictability. Um, but I want you guys to check out a program called eCart. So it's little e, capital C, capital A, capital R, capital T. And again, this is from Donna Edelson and Matt Sherpak. But um, but they've got a program that's cloud-based that just any time you enter a vital sign or a lab gets mm -hmm. resulted, it surveils your patient. Nice. And they've been able to, um, they've published a ton on this, but, um, but they can predict with 93% accuracy if your patient is going to have a cardiac arrest and, wow. and experience demise. Yeah. And then, um, it picks up just decompensation in general. So, all right. So that's kind of the ED. So yeah. you could use SIRS. Now there was a study published in 2016 mm -hmm. where they used two SIRS plus an end title that was right. low. That's fascinating. So what's a normal end title? So end title should be in that 35 to 45 range. Yeah. However, most of the time it's a tad bit lower. Um, just Why? Why based lower? on dead space. And yeah. so you're measuring here versus actual coming out. From yeah. So it will be a little bit lower. But the other thing is patients breathe fast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When they're hospitalized, you're hospitalized for a reason. But what this study was able to show is that triage, when you when they used two SIRS plus infection and then added end title, 
if that end title was less than 25, mm -hmm. it had a 99% positive predictability wow. to say you've got sepsis. That's amazing. Not as good for septic shock, yeah. and you know, I'm hopefully not going through triage mm -hmm. septic shock, but um, but but you yeah. never know. You, you never, never know, know, right? Yeah, but very interesting. So if your end title is less than 25, how are you breathing? You're not breathing 16. No. <laughs> you for might be sure. 28. Yeah, <laughs> yes. then for sure, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of another, um, you know, maybe tool in our toolbox that we can use is, you know, throwing end title with everything mm -hmm. else as yeah. well. Okay. That's Anything a big else? push. Yeah. Um, I know that there's also places that are looping in their lactate levels is a big mm -hmm. part of that. So with their search criteria. Um, but when you get these search criteria, it's not, it's hard, especially when you have early warning systems that are bringing you more pop-ups because we as nurses, oh, we yeah. love pop-ups, don't we? Um, so all of a sudden Cerner or Epic or whoever you use is popping up these nice little things yeah. and saying, Sometimes it's like click, alert, click, click, just alert. trying to go away. And you're like, um, go away. But they are trying, they're trying to help you in the yeah. worst case scenario. They are trying to help and just flag you for those times where something might be happening that you're missing along the way. Yeah, you know, just very challenging. So anyway, so surveillance right now, SIRS is what we've got. If you're if your hospital has news or news or anything running in the background, use it. At least it's kind of a raw way to pick yeah. up patients who are deteriorating. So there's two other programs that I just want to mention that are um, kind of gaining popularity. So they're called SOFA and QSOFA. So have you, uh, SOFA, have you used it? Uh, I have not actually used it in practice for okay. scoring, uh -huh. um, but I've seen it and it's in a lot of the literature and the reviews that I've seen. Yeah, so it stands for Sequential Organ Failure Assessment, and then there's something that's called QSOFA, which is Quick Sequential Organ mm. Failure Assessment. And so SOFA is um, ideally used, I, I would say for the most part in the ICU, because you've got to have lab values. Right. Although there is some utility of running like a, a program that calculates SOFA in the background mm. on acute care patients as well, but it measures things like oxygen oxygenation, your cardiovascular status, so blood pressure, do you need vasopressors, urine output, um, things like that. And so it can kind of just give you an, a raw idea if your patient's heading in the right direction or not. Yeah. So um, so Chris Seymour published a paper a couple years ago about if something that's called QSOFA, or Quick mm -hmm. Sequential Organ Failure Assessment. But basically what he did was he cr looked at three different databases, crunch big data of septic patients and asked the question, what do septic patients look like? Right. So QSOFA, again, quick uh, sequential organ failure assessment, looks at three different things. Right. So, you know, from this database, he crunched big data and got these three values, and they were? Respiratory rates. Yeah, so breathing fast, mm -hmm. um, uh, systolic. Less than 100. Yeah. Yep. And then... And then uh, Altered mental altered status. Mental status. This yeah. is a big one, you guys. If I you, have altered mental status. Yeah, it's morning. okay. It's it's all good. <laughs> but you know, the, altered mental status is key. People get goofy mm -hmm. when they get septic, right. and unfortunately, when you look like who gets septic, it's mostly older people. So mm -hmm. then, what do they get labeled as? Delirium. Dementia or, or delirium. Yeah. You know, so they get mislabeled. But honestly, altered mental status is one of the right. earliest signs that you're getting septic. Yeah. So just I would say pay attention to those yeah. signs. Okay. So anyway. So so that would be kind of a you know sepsis recognition. Again, we don't have the magic bullet. I wish we did. Right. But we just we'd don't. be rich. We yeah. oh yeah. Let's let's figure it out. We'd be <laughs> really rich. Right find now. It. Yeah, but we just we just yeah. don't have it right now. So anyway, but but just look on cues. So patients that are starting you know to deteriorate, breathe faster, maybe get a little, getting a little goofy. Those are the key things you've right. really got to watch out for. So okay, anything else you want to add about sepsis no. recognition? But sepsis are the fun patients. They're the chance to really hone in on your patient, yeah. be the investigator, and find out different clues about them that are going to get you to save their lives. Yeah, and if it's caught early, you can really, you can get them turned around yeah. and really make a difference. So, okay. Well, I'm Nicole Kupchik. This is Joel Green. And this is 10 Minute Tidbits.